So something I've really wanted to make a video about for some time is GNOME Builder. Seems like a really common request in my early VALA programming videos was using an IDE instead of using a text editor. Well in this video we're going to do just that. Let's dive right in on elementary OS and install GNOME Builder. Now for this video I'm going to assume that you already have the proper VALA and GTK libraries required to start your development. So here I'm going to install GNOME Builder itself, also a package called DevHelp, VALA C just in case, and VALA Doc. A really cool thing about GNOME Builder is it has a lot of built-in API docs, or actually what it has is a built-in web browser that points straight at the API docs online, but still, it's really cool. Now this video might seem less like a how-to or tutorial because I want to focus more on GNOME Builder itself. I'm going to be writing a really simple application very similar to the one that I wrote in the Ruby Shoes tutorial in my last video. The idea with this app will be the exact same, only we'll be writing it with Vala and GTK. So now that we've got Builder installed, let's launch the thing. So the first time you launch Builder, you might be more than a little confused. It provides you with no help at all. In fact, if this is the first time you've opened it, you might think that it's broken. On the top right, you have a few buttons. One of them is an X with a circle, and believe it or not, it is some sort of options button. The next button over is a check mark, and it only really works if you have code open, so let's start a project. On the top left hand side there's a button called New, but you don't really want to use it unless you already have a project or code that you want to work with. So what I recommend doing is creating a new file in the file browser, and then open that file with Builder. Seems like a really roundabout way of doing this, but that's how it seems to work. So now that we've loaded a file and effectively have a project working in Builder, Let's explore it a little bit. Up here you've got this handy little context menu that allows you to change the highlight mode and make some other changes to the editor. It's pretty nice to be able to make these changes on the fly rather than having to go to some preferences menu and change them there. If you're working in a gigantic file you can use this to jump to a specific line in there. And then there's this super handy menu that allows you to sort of split the view that you're looking at. I'll show you how this works later. Now one of my favorite things about Builder is this integrated terminal and system monitor. So the integrated terminal is just that, but editors like Scratch and Gedit actually don't have this. The system monitor is also a really cool touch. So if we click that bizarre icon that is a circle with an X in it, you can go to the actual preferences for Builder. Now the preferences window is a very elementary OS menu, and to my knowledge Builder is not associated with elementary OS at all, so maybe it's a nod to elementary OS's UX design, I'm not sure, but there's actually a pretty fair amount that you can change in here, but a lot of it is actually redundant to the menu that we looked at earlier where you can highlight matching brackets and look at the map overview and stuff like that. Builder supports a lot of programming languages, but it only provides code insight for a very small subset of those. Now I was surprised to see how many different themes there were. Builder will happily support night mode and there's a half dozen themes you can choose, all of them look good. For this video I'm going to change the editor to Solarize Light because that's probably my favorite and it's the one that Elementary OS uses by default. So the last thing I want to show you is the built-in documentation. Now these are what those DevHelp and Voladoc packages we installed earlier provide. Being able to split your view and have your code on one side and your documentation on the other side is probably the coolest feature I've ever seen in an IDE. Now I'm sure pretty much any IDE supports this, but I've never seen an IDE provide it in this way. Like Builder makes it really, really easy to just pop open an API docs over here and then have your code over here. But I think we're done exploring, let's start writing some code. So first let's start with a very basic GTK skeleton to get a feel for how the autocomplete or IntelliSense works. So in the terminal we'll type in volacy dash dash pkg and then gtk plus dash 3.0 and then the name of your file, mine is demo.vala. Now when we run this it'll error out because we don't have a main method, so let's do that. All Vala apps need to have a main method, whether it's part of an object or purely procedural. So we'll write our main method as int main, pass in some strings for args, and then in the brackets we'll do init ref args, and then you always want to return zero in your main method. Now notice how everything was underlined with red? That was Builder telling me I was missing something, specifically my semicolon. Now if I were to try to build it without the semicolon, I would have got the same error message as Builder was telling me there. But because Builder has that IntelliSense or CodeSense or whatever they call it, it'll tell me in the editor, so that's really cool. So the main method doesn't actually show anything because we're not telling it to, so let's build our window. So under the using GTK, we'll do window window. The first window is uppercase, the second one is lowercase. 
and you'll notice it's underlined in yellow. That's just a warning telling us that we declared a variable. We haven't used it. So in our main method, we'll do var header equals new header bar. We'll also want to set the title and subtitle in the header, and we'll want to tell the header to show the buttons. In the next block of code, we'll turn our window variable into a new instance of a window. We'll set the window position to center, though I think that that's default. You may not actually need to do that. We'll also want to connect the destroy event to main underscore quit so that our application will quit if the close button is clicked. We'll set the default size to a modest 250, 250. We'll set the window's title bar to the header object we declared above. Windows without borders look weird, so we'll set that to two. And at the bottom, we'll do window.showall and gtk.main. Now when you compile and run your program, you should see a little window. Cool. Now I don't know about you, but I feel like this is an awful lot of code just to show a tiny little window. I also don't love that all this code is shoved into the main method, and what I like to do is create a separate method, call it something like bootstrap, and put all of this code into that function. Now not all of it, you want to leave the init function, the window.showAll function, and the gtk.main function in the main method, but everything else can be extracted out into your new bootstrap method. Once you extract the code out into the bootstrap function, you'll call the bootstrap function after the init function in your main method. Boy, that's a mouthful. So let's add a button to our little window. We'll create a new variable called button. It's equal to a new button with label. Call it whatever you like. Now notice as I type button dot, a little context menu will pop out with a bunch of different options. Now, unfortunately, you have to actually mouse over and click these options. You can't actually hit enter or control space like other IDEs. The context menu kind of teases you and says, hey, you can do all of these things. But then when you hit enter, it just goes to the next line. But anyway, in the clicked signal, we'll change the buttons label to something other than what we set it to. Now, since we're working with buttons, let's go ahead and pull out the API docs. Now let's say that you were just coding an application and you're working with a button, but you didn't know everything that you can do with a GTK button object. Over here you can pull up the API docs and have all of the properties and methods open for a GTK button so you have a better idea of what you can do with it. So take for example the label property. The default value is null, it accepts n number of gchars. Now obviously you can have a browser open and look at the same thing, but it's pretty handy to have it in your IDE like this. So now let's add the button to our window by doing window.addButton. Compile and run and pow, there's our button. So by default, the button is going to take up all of the real estate in our window. To make a button or pretty much any widget behave properly, we have to put it into some sort of construct. In this case, we're gonna use something called a box. We're gonna say box box is equal to a new box with orientation of horizontal and a padding of four. Then on the next line, we're gonna do box.pack start. We'll pass in our button, followed by two falses, and then the number two for padding. So you might be wondering, well, what do those two falses mean? And that's where we're gonna pull up the API docs again. So all we do is search for pack start, and it's right here. Those two falses are for expanding and filling. It's just different ways of handling widgets inside of the box. However, when we go to compile and run our application, you'll see that the button is gone. And at the bottom here, it says attempting to add a widget with a type GTK button to a container of type GTK window, but that widget is already inside of a type GTK box. So what it's telling us is that we're trying to add the button to the window, but also adding the button to the container. So in other words, on line 30, we've added the button to the box, but then we turn around on line 32 and attempt to add said button to the window, but it can't because it's in the box. So we resolve this by instead of doing window.addButton, we do window.addBox. And here it is. Now when we scale our window, the button doesn't take up all of the real estate. It stays on the left-hand side. Now because we're using a box and we're using padding with the box, we can actually set the default size from 250, 250 to 0, 250 because the box is going to handle the horizontal spacing. All right, so we're about 10 minutes into this video and I think this might be a good place to leave it here. I know that there's a lot more that we can do with this app and I actually had a fair amount of footage for this video, but I didn't expect it to go so long. 
But I'll tell you what, if you liked this video, and especially liked it enough to make it this far into the video, why don't you let me know what you thought of it in the comments below, and let me know how long you expect these programming videos to be, and what topics you want to cover. This video was supposed to focus on Builder, but we kind of got off topic, and now we're basically building an app, and I probably could have split this video up into like two, maybe even three different videos. So yeah, why don't you guys let me know what you think in the comments below, and I appreciate all your support, and thanks for watching.